Hello, everyone, and welcome back to 305 Insights, where today we're going to be discussing the Big 12 and our preview for that conference. The way these are going to be structured, because we're going to do all of them in terms of the P4, is we're going to go through the top tier programs, sleeper teams, teams in trouble, most impactful players, and the biggest games that I think are on the schedule for these conferences. So we're going to do it for the ACC, the Pac-2, or no, the Pac-2, <laughs> they don't exist anymore, um, the Big Ten, and the SEC. And like I said, we're going to start off with the Big 12. So when I say top-tier programs, those are the these are the programs that I believe have a shot to make the college football playoffs as well as obviously win the league itself. So we're going to try and limit it to two teams per, you know, top tier sleeper or teams in trouble if there are any. So that being said, I believe the top tier programs in the Big 12 are Utah and Oklahoma State. There is a sense of commonality with both of these programs in the idea that Mike Gundy has been there for forever. Kyle Whittingham has been there for forever. But besides that, Utah is the most talented team, and I believe they have the best coach in the league. They have an incredible home field advantage. I mean, you should see their numbers. um, If you do not include the COVID year or post-COVID year, the home field advantage that Utah has is incredible. It is an underrated place to play in the sense that I don't think nationally people don't understand how difficult it is to play there. And it's not one of the largest stadiums in the country. I believe it holds anywhere from fifty to 58,000, somewhere around there. But they made their voices heard. So using that and the identity of the team it, it was always a little bit different than the Pac-12 outside of maybe Oregon under Cristobal and Dan Lanning about that more physical nature that wasn't prevalent in the Pac-12. So they should only worry about the Oklahoma State game. And in all honesty, if they don't have a minimum of 10 wins this season, it should be a disappointing season for Utah. So a lot of expectations for the program in that sense. And they are probably the only team in the Big 12 that can make some noise in the college football playoffs. I have Oklahoma State here as well because, like I said, Mike Gundy is the coach, the tenure. He knows what it takes to win there. Every once in a while, he has those 10 or 11 win seasons. This might be one of those seasons now that he doesn't have to worry about Texas and Oklahoma on his schedule. It's a, uh, it's probably at, it should be an eight or nine win season. So can you win those toss up games moving forward with some of your veteran leadership on offense? And we'll touch on one of those later on. So Gundy does have the ability sometimes he has these head scratching losses like i believe they lost to north alabama state or one of those you know programs that you pay to beat basically a few years ago but i think he's going to find his groove with this team and and really try and keep the head above the water in the big 12 because there's a lot of teams out there that are sneaky good but there's also a lot of bottom feeders that you have to take advantage of. Speaking of the sleeper teams, the two I have are Arizona and Iowa State. Arizona has a lot of talent coming back on offense, and the only question is how will Brett Brennan take over for Jed Fish? You've got one of the most dynamic quarterbacks coming back. you got one of the best wide receivers in the country coming back. How will they replicate the offensive success from the year before? It might be a slightly different system. That's where the only question is with Arizona. The talent's there. They kept 
the talent with uh, generous donations from mega donors to make sure that once they lost Jed Fish, they wouldn't lose the whole program in the sense of everything that made them successful last year. The donors and the alumni stepped up. So we'll see how Arizona performs. I do have them as a, as a really sneaky good team in the sense that there is a ton of potential in offense. And historically the big 12 gravitates towards offense However, we've seen a slight shift recently in that there's been a little bit more of an efficient type defense played. Again, they do run a lot of plays, but if you look deeper into the numbers, into the analytics, the Big 12 does have efficient defenses when you compare them on a play-by-play basis. Iowa State's always a consistent program, and Matt Campbell is cooking something once again. He's got a stellar defense and a young QB at the helm that they finally figured out last year what to do with. And he's always been a coach that can coach up talent. It's just a matter of having enough talent there to do so. So this might be the year that Matt Campbell reminds people why he was such a name brand for all the coaches hot seats in the sense of replacing them at their respective schools uh, a few years ago. I mean, he was always on the list of, you know, when uh, FSU was having their troubles, he was on the list there. He was on the list for Texas. I believe Um, he, all the big programs that had openings, the way that he's built up Iowa state, he's made a name for himself in the coaching industry. So, Again, this could be one of those years that he reminds people why he had all that hype, in a sense, to get those jobs. Teams in trouble. Again, when we say teams in trouble, we're primarily focused on the coaches, but obviously the team is in trouble if the coach is in trouble. Kind of redundant there, but follow me here. I got Baylor and Dave Aranda. Three and nine last year means that 12 and two 2021 team seems even farther than ever. Dave is Dave Ronda has taken over the defense, which is, was always his specialty. Uh, that's why he was hired at Baylor because of all the defenses that he coached at LSU and in his prior stops, that's where he made his name. I believe he, at the time he was the highest paid coordinator at when he was at LSU, he was the highest paid coordinator in the country. And he hired an uh, air raid coach and offensive quarter, Jake. Oh, man, I really butchered the writing of that name. Spottle? Ooh, I should write more clearly on my notes. Can they change the course of the program with those two changes? Now, the reason why they hired an air raid coach is because they have a very weak offensive line. And a lot of the times with the air raid offense, you have quick reads in the sense of option A or option B will be open. If not, just dump it up to option C. And it's just using the spacing and having those windows to throw the ball. If the offensive line is not that good, you can't run a pro style system. You can't run a run based counter game, et cetera, et cetera. You have to run a system that masquerades your weakness and, it is comforting that he, as if you're a Baylor fan, it is comforting that he has made these choices to try and improve the program because you have seen the potential that they could have under Aranda. So it's just a matter of executing. So I, I don't, again, I don't think he's a bad coach. I just think the results are getting farther and farther away from what the program wants, which is the issue. Baylor expects to be competitive. They're in the state of Texas ever since Art Bryles and RG3 in that run really brought them to national prominence. They invested in the new stadium. They've invested in facilities. They want to be at the big kids table, at the adults table, actually. So they want to keep it that way. So if Dave Ryan doesn't produce, expect him to be gone. Cincinnati and Scott Satterfield. After going 17 and 19 in his last three seasons, Satterfield was able to see Jeff Brom 
lead the team to a 10 and 4 record. He didn't do himself any favors by going 3 and 9 last year and 1 and 8 in the Big 12. He's only been there one year, but you got to remember Cincinnati the 2 years prior went 9 and 4 and 13 and 1. That 13 and 1 season was the magical season where they went undefeated and they faced Alabama in the playoffs when they had the 14 playoffs. You can say that there's an exodus in talent, all this stuff with the coaching staff leaving. However, three and nine is rough. Three and nine is really, really rough. And again, one in eight in the Big 12. That means you basically won either an out of conference game or some cupcake games, and then one game in your conference. It's it's not a good look. And again, he went 17 and 19 in the last three seasons in Louisville, and then Jeff Brom takes the team over and goes 10 and 4, reaches the ACC championship game. Tough look, tough look. And Cincinnati, again, has expectations now in the sense of the, the type of run that they've had with Brian Kelly and Luke Fickle at the helm. They expect to be a competitive team, and, and just having that first season. And then their, their taste of the of the Power Five, which is now Power Four conferences, not a good look. The most impactful players I see in this conference, we start off with, again, the top tier programs. I got Utah QB Cam Rising as one of the most impactful players. Again, the veteran leadership that he brings. You saw even last year, I believe they went eight and four. Imagine if they had someone like Cam Rising without, you didn't have to lean too much on the young kids. This kid's been a winner. This kid's won Pac-12 championships. He knows what it takes to lead a team. And he will be a vital piece for Utah this season in making sure that they reach the college football playoffs. Oklahoma State running back, Ollie Gordon the second. I mean, in terms of stats, this is one of the most productive running backs in the country. This is someone, again, Oklahoma State has, has kind of leaned more towards air raid because of where Mike Gundy has come from in terms of his coaching tree. However, leaning on this young kid makes it all the more easier for the offense to be more effective and expect them to do that this season. Arizona wide receiver. Oh man, I'm going to butcher this name. Tataro McMillan. Tatyra McMillan. All right, let's move on from that. Uh, He's one of the best wide receivers in the country. He's around 6'5", 200-plus pounds. He's going to be a a first-round pick this year. And he's one of the reasons why Arizona's a sleeper team and how they expect to be incredibly efficient on offense. And that's what they're going to lean on this year, their QB-wide receiver combo. Man, I butchered two names, two or three names in this podcast. Got to write clean around. The final impactful player we have is Colorado wide receiver slash cornerback Travis Hunter. Now I know we haven't mentioned Colorado in any of this, even though they're one of the most talked about teams in the country. But again, in all honesty, there is no expectations for this team. If they go better than their four and eight last year, congratulations, but they're virtually picked at the bottom. in a lot of these previews that you see, from national experts and sporting websites across the country. So again, I'm on that boat as well. Is the offensive line improved enough to protect Shador Sanders? Do they have a running game? Can the defense hold up? Is there depth on this team? I don't know. However, you have Travis Hunter, the two-way player that you don't really know where he fits in the next level, but his influence on the game is undeniable. When you play, both charge of the ball. There's there's a lot to be said about that. And effectively as well. I know he got burned a lot in that Stanford game uh, at cornerback. But again, the amount of times that the ball ends up in Travis Hunter's hands is better for Colorado. Biggest games, Utah, Oklahoma State on September 21st. Again, those are the two favorites. Whoever wins that has the inside track at the college football playoffs, as well as Big 12 championship, where I expect them to rematch. Colorado, Nebraska, 
again, that's kind of, uh, it's obviously an out of conference, but that's on September 7th. I believe that's a big game for both these programs in the sense of where the season will go will be dictated from that game. Nebraska's got a young team. We'll, di- we'll discuss a little bit on the Big Ten podcast about them. And Colorado, again, where does the Deion Sanders coach prime hype train go from here? Kansas at Kansas State, October 26th. And then Arizona, Utah, September 28th. Again, the Arizona Utah sleeper team versus the perennial favorite. And then Kansas at Kansas State, that's always just a good rivalry game to watch. And we'll see how, you know, the expectations are moving forward for Kansas under Lance Leopold and if Kansas State can keep up the momentum that they've had over the past few years. So. A little shorter preview this time. For I expect the other ones to be a little longer because there needs to be more in-depth discussions about the top-tier programs. Unfortunately, with the Big 12, they're probably the weakest conference. They might be the most fun conference to watch, however. Don't get me wrong. When I say weakest in the sense of how many teams that can contribute to the college football playoff discussion. I'm really stretching it with Oklahoma State. I don't I don't think they're going to be able to win. However, they are the, one of the top-tier programs in the Big 12. Utah, to me, is the only one that can make some noise in this, in this uh, conference. So going forward in the SEC, ACC, Big 10, they're probably going to be a little bit longer discussions because of the teams that are expected to make the college football playoffs. That being said, we're going to turn these out real quick before the end of the week just to get these out before the season starts. So expect to get more content swiftly. So you guys know the drill already, how we end the podcast. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on YouTube. Like, subscribe, follow, do all that positive stuff. Give us feedback if you have some. And thanks for stopping by, folks. Thanks for listening on this episode of 305 Insights. Have a good one.